Welcome to numerical methods. So we are still in our section on random number generation. Yeah, having started with the uniform distributed random numbers, we now moved to a section generating random number sequences of other distributions. So we are here in this section. And what we did last time was we had a look here at the inversion of the distribution function method. And we already discussed the example, the normal distributed random variable and had a nice code session. So uh, this is based here on this lemma. Yeah? So given a uniform distributed random variable, which I use here, I can transform that to an F distributed random variable uh, using here my inversion of the distribution function and I get a random variable X, which is F distributed. So applying now this inversion of the distribution function to a uniform sequence, I get a sequence of XI and this sequence of XI is a sampling of the random variable X having F distribution. I like to discuss today another example. Uh, yeah, the method is very simple here for the exponential distributed random variable, but I also like to give you a little bit intuition for the exponential distributed random variable because it is quite important. Yeah, not only in our application, mathematical finance, but also in other applications. So what is an exponential distributed random variable. So there is a parameter, yeah, like for the normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation, we have some uh, parameter here. So this parameter is lambda. Lambda should be larger than zero. And the distribution function for the exponential distributed random variable is given here. It's f of x is zero. If x is below zero, so probability that x below zero is zero. And then it is one minus exponential minus lambda x. So if you plot this function, yeah, it looks like this here. So first it's zero, and then we have here a slope lambda, and then we are slowly approaching one in the limit. So the slope is lambda, of course, if you differentiate this, you get the density. So if you have, if you like, you can calculate here the density. So little, little f, for example, so this is f prime of x, I differentiate one, this vanishes exponential. So I get a minus lambda in front, so minus a minus, I get a lambda in front, so that is just lambda exponential minus lambda x, plug in the zero, and you see that in zero you have slope lambda, and then it's approaching uh, one. So if you like to do the inversion of the distribution function, yeah, what do you do? Okay, so maybe have a small calculation here. You take your uniform, say for example, your uniform is u, yeah, and this should be equal to, say, f of x, yeah, and now solve this, so this is, the u is equal to 1 minus exponential minus lambda x, so this, this should be my u, and then, yeah, bring the 1 to the other side, so you have u minus 1 multiply with minus 1. So you have 1 minus u is exponential minus lambda x. Take the logarithm. So you have logarithm 1 minus u is minus lambda x divided by minus lambda. So I have 1 minus 1 divided by lambda 1 minus u, and this gives me my x. So this is now the sampling of the exponential distributed random variable x, Yeah, if I have a uniform u. 
So we have the inversion method for the homogeneous exponential distribution by calculating minus one divided by lambda, logarithm of one minus u. Okay, simple method. Um, let me give you first an intuition yeah, for this um, distribution, so why it is so important, and then maybe discuss also a little bit the limit cases as we did for the normal distribution in our previous example, because yeah, you have to be maybe a bit careful with the limit cases. Yeah, interpretation, the exponential distribution, so this is used in the modeling of say events, for example, default times, yeah, when a company goes bankrupt, yeah, or also yeah, if a machine yeah fails, yeah, so if it if it's broken, if it breaks, yeah, this is modeling some some uh, event yeah that can occur with a certain uh, probability. So the random variable X, yeah, that we had is actually a time, yeah, and for that reason, yeah, I now often use the letter, for example, tau. So I have a stochastic time, and probability that we are below zero is zero. So this time maps omega to zero infinity. Yeah. So when does it happen? And say, for example, zero is just now. Then the distribution function also has a nice um, interpretation. Yeah. So this P tau less or equal tau is the probability that the event happened before. Sorry, I, I said tau. Yeah. So P of tau less or equal t, little t, is the probability that the event happened before t. If you take the inverse of that event, yeah, the complementary event, this is 1 minus 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. So this is just exponential minus lambda t. This is the probability that we survive up to time little t. So this is called the survival probability, the probability that the event did not happen up to time little t. Yeah, so that's uh, an important model. And an interesting thing is that this model actually is based on a single comparably natural assumption. Yeah, So this distribution follows from the model assumption that the trigger that leads to the event, yeah, so whatever this is, so for example, the company goes bankrupt or something in a machine fails, this default event is uh, memoryless. So I have here this condition, yeah, so this is maybe called eight here, this condition that it is memoryless. So what does it mean? So the probability that the we survive up to time t2, so this here is the probability that we survive up to time t2, conditional that we know that we have already survived up to time t1, just depends on the period length from t1 to t2. So this is actually equal as if you would observe this period at some other time. Yeah? So you can shift it around. So this just depends on the probability. This is just the probability that tau is larger than t2 minus t1. So this means memoryless. Yeah, I do not care yeah, at what time I am. It's just that I am, uh, I have survived up to time t1, and then it just depends on the time passing starting from um, t1. So if you plug in now the definition of the conditional probability, yeah, so the probability that we observe event A, conditional that we know that we have observed B, this is the probability of the intersection, so tau larger than t2 and tau larger than t1, divided by the probability of the condition. Okay, now you see that 
on top, yeah, you have the intersection of tau larger than t2 and tau larger than t1. Yeah, but if you know that you are already larger than t2, then the other event is contained in this. Yeah, so this is just the probability that we will survive yeah, up to time t2. So I can plug this in now. So this is the probability that I survive up to time t2. Okay, so move move this guy here to the other side. Yeah, so you have the probability that we survive up to time t1. Yeah, multiplied here with this part. Yeah? Okay, but now I plug in my eight again. So this part was just the probability to survive this time span from t1 to t2. So you see that uh, eight is actually a kind of product structure. Yeah. So the probabilities that we survive, yeah, just multiply. Yeah. They just accumulate in some product structure. So you have here a product. And now you can do a little trick. Yeah. So consider, for example, that our time capital T yeah, is, say, given, and we now perform a discretization. Yeah? So let's have, say, Ti is just I divided by N capital T, some kind of discretization. Then you can write P tau larger than t, so the probability that we survive up to capital T as the, just the product of those little intervals. Yeah? So here i from 0 to n minus 1, and then the probability that we survive a time span from ti to ti plus 1. Yeah? So you can have this little discretization and you, you just plug in here our little product structure. So now here in this formula, yeah, all the time spans are of the same size. Yeah, they are just one divided by n times capital T. So actually this is the probability to survive a small time step and then multiplied n times so to the power of n. Yeah. If you have this, I have that the probability, the probability to survive up to time capital T is actually the probability to survive a small step to the power of n. Yeah, then I can just rewrite the to the power of n. So I have here my probability surviving this small time step, and here I have the 2 to the power of n. I can re just rewrite this as the exponential of the logarithm of this probability multiplied with n. So you just have here rewritten the power. Yeah? So this is still the probability to survive this little time step. Yeah? From that, I take the logarithm and I multiply with n. Yeah, and now uh, I just rewrite a little bit this n, yeah? So you see there is still the n here, and there is, of course, still here the probability to survive this little time step. I just multiply with a t, and I divide with a t. And you see, you can now interpret this here as our little lambda. So the probability to survive up to time capital T can be expressed as exponential uh, logarithm of sur surviving a small time step uh, divided by T divided by N divided by the time step size. Okay, this guy uh, depends on N. So actually, maybe I should have written lambda N, but actually you see that the left-hand side doesn't depend on the N. So you can choose any N. Yeah, we can maybe just let um, the n go to infinity, yeah? and then I define that to be my lambda. Yeah? 
So of course, I mean, all the lambdas ends are the same. We just define now the lambda to be the limit n goes to infinity of, uh, actually there has to be a minus, right? Because our definition is exponential minus lambda t. Uh, okay, so this defines here the minus lambda. Okay, so let's write this correctly. This is the minus lambda. Okay, so we define minus lambda to be the limit of logarithm probability survive the small time step divided by the time step size. So this is minus the limit probability to survive the small time step divided here now by the time step size. Yeah, instead of letting n go to infinity, yeah, I can just introduce now my time step size, say this is a little t. So I have here the probability to survive up to a time little t divided by the time little t. And you see, actually, this is differentiating the function logarithm of probability tau larger than t with respect to t in zero. So you see also my claim again that our lambda is just the a slope, yeah, it is the slope of minus the probability tau larger than t in, in, in zero. So you see, very, very nice thing here. Oops. So you see that the exponential distribution obviously fulfills this number eight here. But also, if you have the number eight, the property that the trigger is memoryless, then this implies that we have an exponential distribution with this parameter uh, lambda. Okay, here's a small figure that shows you the discrete uh, analog. So what we do, okay, so you have a probability to survive. Yeah, so you survive the first time step or you have the probability to default. If you did not default, yeah, the event goes on and you have again the same probability for the next time step yeah, to, to default. Yeah? So the survival is just the product structure where we always multiply these uh, one minus p. Yeah, you could implement a simulation algorithm like that, yeah, always drawing one minus p or our p, always drawing p, yeah, and generating the default times by that. But maybe that's, yeah, sometimes it's useful to do it like that. But um, in general, it's it's not so efficient. With our match method, we can immediately sample for any sample pass the time where it happens, and then we sample a new one. Let's continue discussing the interpretation. So if tau models a time, the tau is now a time. Yeah, then you actually see that since a probability is an object that has no physical unit, yeah, it is a scalar that has no physical unit, you actually see that the lambda has to be something that is one divided by time, yeah? So to make the units correct. Okay, so lambda is something like a frequency. Yeah, so lambda has a unit one divided by time, so it is a frequency. Yeah, if lambda has the unit one divided by time, yeah, so one divided by a second, for example, if tau is measured in seconds, then one divided by lambda has again the unit time. And this one divided by lambda also has a very nice interpretation. It is the expected time at which the event happens, yeah? Starting in time zero, yeah? So the expected time span uh, when we uh, expect the event. Yeah, do we see this? Okay, um, the expectation yeah, is the integral of T density of this random variable dt. So I can express here the expectation as 
the integral t phi of t dt, that's the expectation of tau. What is the density? The density is the derivative. I've calculated that previously. So this is just lambda comes to the front, the minus is canceling. Yeah? Uh, lambda times exponential minus lambda t. Yeah? So if you integrate this, you get a one divided by lambda, you get indeed a one divided by lambda. So this is the expected time of the event. Okay, so now we have maybe a good intuition for this. Let's look what happens if we implement this. Okay, I could do some coding, but maybe it's obvious enough. Um, we have this problem that our random number generators could sometimes generate the corner cases u equals zero or u equals one. So the general situation is that the generators generate u equals zero, but they do not generate u equals one. Um, so what was our inversion of the distribution function? So just maybe recall, we had the time tau is minus one divided by lambda, take the logarithm of one minus u. So if you have, for example, u equals zero, yeah, u equals zero would be a logarithm of one. Okay, so the logarithm of one is zero. So u equals zero would correspond to tau equals zero. So this means that the event happens immediately. Yeah, so we have just default just now. If you consider u equals one, that would map to logarithm of zero. Logarithm of zero, yeah, that is a minus infinity. Yeah, so if u approaches one, the logarithm of one minus u approaches minus infinity. I have a minus in front, so that maps to a plus infinity. So this means that the event will never happen. Yeah, so now as a programmer, you have to be a little bit careful. So your tau is between zero and plus infinity. But often the plus infinity is not a problem from the programming perspective. Yeah, you just have to be sure that if you program this now, that you check that plus infinity can happen. Because if you just check, did I be default or did I not default for a time little t, then this test t less or equal positive infinity this is true yeah, for any floating point number. Yeah? So any floating point number here means that I have a number, so it is not, say, uh, not a number. Um, so if you just use this method to generate now times that are used in testing MIP4 at yeah, that time, then it's perfectly okay to have an infinity in, in the sequence. And it has a nice intuitive interpretation. Yeah, the event will never happen. Yeah, let's conclude by uh, generalizing this to the inhomogeneous exponential distributed random variable. So my exponential distributed random variable is now inhomogeneous. Though that means my lambda may depend on time on t. So I have a lambda of s here. So the lambda times t now becomes an integral, integral from zero to t, lambda of s ds. Yeah? So if you choose the lambda again as a constant, it will be again the lambda times times t in the hmm, one minus exponential minus function. Yeah, okay, this is... Um, if you say, for example, you differentiate this, so you look, say, for example, at the density, and you differentiate this, okay, the one goes away, a minus comes in front, yeah? so the inner derivative is just a lambda of t, yeah? Inti differentiating the integral gives me just the upper bound here, the lambda of t, 
And then I have again the exponential minus integral zero t lambda s ds. So this is just the lambda of t multiplied with the probability that I have already survived up to time little t. So again, it is just the past multiplied with now my lambda of t. So it is like the slope parameter Yeah, is just uh, varying um, a little bit. Of course, you can do the inversion of the distribution function method, but for this now, I need the inverse of this integral. Yeah. So for the homogeneous one, solving this inverse of the integral was just divided by lambda. But now I need the inverse of this integral. So I have here, um, say, a capital lambda, which should be this integral, integral of zero to t, lambda of SDS, and then I need the lambda inverse. Apart from this, yeah, everything is the same. So I have my minus logarithm one minus u, but I need to, yeah, the division by lambda is now replaced with apply the inverse of this integral. And this can be difficult in practical application. Yeah? So what can we do? Well, in practical application, this distribution here is a model and usually you fit your model uh, to your observations. Yeah? And often is that you do not have so many observations. I mean, this here is a time continuous function. Yeah? So it is varying. Yeah? Uh, and you do not observe so many data points yeah, that you can fit the whole function. So often discretizing this function is not a big problem. So we can maybe discretize this integral and then it is very easy to apply the method. So the inversion method can also be used here to approximately sample this inhomogeneous distribution function, exponential distribution function. And in practical applications, this is often uh, sufficient. Yeah, It is a sufficiently good model. So what I do is I have a time discretization, say small time steps, t0 is 0, and then t1 up to tn. And now I assume I know the partial integrals. Yeah, I know, for example, here the parameter lambda i, which is just the partial integral, integral from ti to ti plus one, lambda of s ds, divided by the time step size, divided by ti plus one minus ti. So it is the average of the function lambda over this time step from ti to ti plus one. Of course, you know now that you can express the capital lambda at a certain point in time, say for example, at a ti, you can express this guy by just summing these partial integrals. So this is a j from zero to i minus one, just the lambda j. So I'm summing the partial integrals because I have divided here by the time step size, you know, since this is an average, yeah, I have to multiply, of course, here also with the time step size. So this is j plus one minus uh, tj plus one minus tj, tj. So you have lambda exact at the time discretization points. Uh, and now you can write down the, say, approximate distribution function, or you say, I just consider from the start this model. So I consider now this model. I consider the uh, time discretized inhomogeneous exponential distribution 
is my model. So this is now the partial integral, yeah, the partial integral from zero to, yeah, this goes to ti minus one plus one. Yeah, so this here is an i minus one. This here is an j plus one. So this goes up to ti. And then I just have the remaining step from ti to t. Yeah, this is now also just approximated as if lambda would be constant in this. Yeah, so this is a piecewise constant lambda, as if lambda would be constant in this interval. So I just approximate this here with the lambda i times the end time t minus ti. Yeah, so the little partial time step. This is now my distribution function. This looks uglier, but implementing the inversion is easier. I can now exactly imp implement the inversion. So how is this done? Yeah, for, um, sorry. Yeah, you start again by sampling your uniform. Yeah, then you say do the inversion as if lambda would be one. So you sample z being minus logarithm of one minus u. So this here is the first step. This is the set. Yeah. Okay. Minus logarithm one minus u. And now I have to apply the lambda. Yeah. The one divided by lambda. If um, I would have a constant and homogeneous exponential distribution, or the lambda capital lambda inverse of my integral. So I have to check the inversion of the integral. Yeah, and I have these partial sums. So I just check what is the integral part that is smaller than my z. So what is the index i for which the integral part up to i minus one lies below z and the integral, so actually, this is the integral up to i, yeah? So this is the integral from zero to ti. So I check which i do I get that z lies between the integral from zero to ti and the integral from zero to ti plus one. So this here is the integral from zero to ti plus one. Then I have found this index i. And then I know that my default time lies in this interval. And I just solve for the correct default time. So my tau is now this time ti. So I already know that I'm after this time ti. And in this interval, my lambda is assumed to be constant. Yeah, I just use the inversion of the distribution function as if lambda would be constant. So I just apply one divided by lambda i, z, yeah, minus the integral up to ti um, is then the solution. So this is finding tau uh, for an inhomogeneous exponential distribution. Yeah, here simplified where the lambdas are assumed to be piecewise constant. So I have a piecewise constant intensity in, in this model and often this is uh, sufficient. Okay, so that was it maybe for, yeah, that was it maybe for the inversion of the distribution function. We will use this method very often. Yeah? It's very powerful. I will also maybe combine it with the next uh, method.